So you're having a holiday dinner with your family. And then your sister, who is in town from college, brings up that she's been working to help elect a socialist candidate for office. Grandpa then yells out, why do you want to destroy freedom? Squirrel, predictably, shouts back, because my candidate is trying to defeat fascist racists that your generation keeps voting for. Uncle Pig then adds, this is what happens when your communist professors teach you that critical race theory crap at college that I heard about on Tucker. Mom then comes in and says, I just wish all these extremists would go away. What happened to respectable conservatives in America, like George Bush? <gasps> then little Johnny Penguin adds, uh, this is why I'm an anarchist. All these people are crooks. Everybody then turns to little Johnny and says, anarchy could never work. <laughs> all right. Just what's going on here? How much of this is actual difference of opinion, and how much is misunderstanding caused by some of the labels that people are using to represent certain ideas? How could people in the same family have such strong differences of opinions? More importantly, are they even talking about the same things? Could it be that some of the words and labels in this conversation, like socialism, CRT, anarchism, conservative, racist, and freedom, mean very different things to different people? Well, in this episode, we'll take a look at this and the importance of the concept called framing. Linguists have long noted that meaning is not something created by the speaker or author alone. Instead, it is something that is created when the words hit the brain of the person receiving the communication regardless of what the speaker or writer thinks it actually means. So to get an accurate message across, people need to be conscious not just of what they're trying to say, but how other people may be hearing it. So if you are arguing for creating a more fair, sustainable, and inclusive society, and you actually want to gain allies instead of alienating people, you have to appreciate what words mean, not when they leave your mouth, but when they hit other people's ears. And to understand that, we have to talk about the concept of framing. So what is framing? Well, one of the leading theorists on framing is George Lakoff, and he defines it this way. He says, quote, frames are mental structures that shape the way we see the world. All words are defined relative to conceptual frames. When you hear a word, its frame or collection of frames is activated in your brain. So let me give an example of this. For instance, if I say the phrase, destroy capitalism, what does this mean to the person hearing it? When people hear these words, it links to frames already in their heads. So when I say destroy capitalism, some people think I mean overturning an exploitive social and economic system in favor of a more egalitarian future. Of course, some people will have no idea exactly just what the heck I'm talking about and perhaps feel a mixture of confusion or discomfort. Still others will assume that if I say destroy capitalism, I'm advocating tyranny, a loss of freedom, and a dictatorial government that will enslave people in a Stalinist work camp. Even though this last interpretation is light years away from what I mean when I say we should end capitalism, there are many people whose framing is that capitalism equates to democracy, self-determination, tradition, religious freedom, and freedom of choice. Why? Well, because narratives in the U.S. over decades have made an argument that there is a bundle of American values that come as a package, capitalism, freedom, and democracy. And to many folks, that package of values is threatened by and must be defended from anyone claiming they want to destroy any of these. This, however, is of course not what anyone criticizing capitalism is advocating, but the frame of the listener encourages that misinterpretation. When the labels that we throw at each other are thoroughly misunderstood, it can lead not just to unnecessary conflict, but to truly dangerous processes of dehumanization and the demonization of people we disagree with. How? Well, it can cause a group of like-minded people to think that another group of people actually embraces a truly evil and threatening agenda. If you are a conservative and you think the label socialism actually stands for a political program that aims to tax you into poverty, take away your house, establish a dictatorship, and put you into a camp and re-educate you like Maoists did in the Cultural Revolution, well, then you are going to respond to someone who comes to your door campaigning for a socialist candidate as being an existential threat to you, your family, and your way of life. Of course, 
The person at your door promoting socialism is certainly not advocating any of these threatening things that you might be thinking of. They may even directly tell you this, but you might think, based on what the label socialism means to you, that the person at your door is being dishonest about their true intentions or that they are naive and, quote, don't really understand that any move towards socialism, even affordable health care or better public education, will eventually lead to suffering, poverty, and dictatorship. In this case, neither person is likely to see the other as a reasonable person whom they might actually share some things in common, but instead they will see each other as monsters. They may both think, this person is truly evil, but for different reasons. They'll see each other as existential political threats that can't be trusted and who must be overcome by ballot or perhaps someday by bullet. What is particularly sad is that this mutual dehumanization is frequently encouraged by politicians and popular media figures because they can get ratings, votes, and rabid followers by manipulating frames which create a myth that they alone can save their supporters from the supposedly evil and threatening others who are allegedly plotting against them. In short, many elites purposely weaponize framing to create more social discord because they benefit politically or personally from doing so. The way these pundits and politicians conduct this dehumanization is by way of deceptive framing. They take a term the other side believes in or promotes, and then they weave a linguistic web that convinces their supporters that this term means something that none of the people using it actually mean. So, how we, can we combat this kind of weaponized framing that tries to demonize people who hold different opinions? Also, how can we use framing in a positive way to humanize people we disagree with, to construct opportunities for us to have thoughtful dialogue about honest disagreements and create more social connections and solidarities with people so that we can build better communities? Well, number one, first, when we see it, we need to call out weaponized framing that is willfully misrepresenting what people actually believe. If you hear someone talking about the outlandish things that, quote, they want to do with to you or to people like, quote, us, you might want to be very skeptical about this. Even if the pundit or politician is able to trot out a couple of extremist examples, which they are trying to paint as being representative of what all of, quote, them are supposedly about. Second, if you are interested in creating positive social change and building inclusive communities, it is helpful to be mindful of how other people may hear what you are saying. Are you using terms that people are likely to misinterpret? Also, are you lecturing at people or talking with them? A good general rule here is to focus more on finding common ground on what people want to happen and focus less on what you are against. So instead of just saying destroy capitalism or never socialism or anarchy can't work when someone brings it up, maybe find ways to focus on talking about things in a positive way. And I don't mean positive here as in talking about it in a happy way. I mean focus more on the details of what you really would like to occur. Focus on that rather than what you oppose. What would someone hear differently if instead of saying destroy capitalism, I said I think we should all be owners. Or, instead of, America is so racist, I said, I think we still live in a society where access to opportunity and justice is still very uneven in regards to race. What do you think are some things we can do to address this? Now, staying focused on what you are actually for isn't a trick or a tactic of conversion. It is a technique for creating bonds of solidarity between people who already may have a fair amount of agreement about what should be, but who might not necessarily know that because they have long been misunderstanding each other's terminologies and what they actually want. Why use terms that the majority of listeners are going to misunderstand when they hear them? When you are considering the practical political effects of what you are saying, it does not matter what you think you mean. It matters what your listener thinks you mean. You could try to, quote, educate the person and convince them your meaning is the correct one, which is an uphill battle fraught with the potential of the other person feeling resentful and lectured at. Or you could use language that helps skeptical listeners understand what you are actually talking about and which seeks common ground and avoids misunderstandings that generate more fear. It is important for activists to understand the power of speaking simply, 
using accessible language, explaining unfamiliar concepts, and of making pronouncements in positive ways that resonate with positive frames in your listener and which emphasize what you are for as opposed to what you are against. Now, positive framing, of course, won't stop all our arguments at dinner. People, after all, will always have genuine differences of opinion about how our world works and how it should work. People will still disagree about many things. We can, however, avoid the demonization of people and ideas if we understand that more people agree about the basics of a good life than you may think. The monsters you may think are out there, full of bad ideas and outlandish intentions, may not be as plentiful as you have been led to believe. <laughs>